This conference will now be recorded. All right, go ahead. All right, ready to get started? I'm gonna wait for anybody else to get on or it's 11 gonna be our number. If you wanna wait a minute, you can, but I, my suspicion is people will trickle in here in the next minute. Okay, we'll give it a minute or two. First couple of slides are review slides, so we'll go through them pretty quick, but I'll give it a couple minutes. Hey, Dr. Clifton, how do you go back on slides if you've advanced with the GoToMeeting open? It's usually hit the back button. Yeah, it's not working. When I hit exit, it tries to exit out of the whole GoToMeeting. I hit escape. Yeah, yeah that's, I, when I hit escape, to, it tries to exit out of the whole uh, GoToMeeting. Look at the bottom left corner. You see those arrows? Is that oh, yeah. yeah. Got it. <laughs> if you had only done that one more year of research, you would have nailed that. I know. <laughs> it's not a six year program for me. All right, let's get let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think we have most people that we're gonna have. So good morning, everybody. We're gonna talk about uh, surgical management of the axilla and breast cancer this morning. We got a lot, lot to talk about, so we're gonna, we're gonna move pretty quickly. I just ask that if, if you have questions, just try to hold them till the end, um, unless it's uh, pretty glaring. Um, the the goal of this talk is really to discuss some of the uh, landmark papers that have led to our current management of the axilla. Um, it's pretty nuanced and controversial, and so you may have a lot of questions kind of throughout the talk, um, and hopefully we can answer most of those as we go through it. Um, so just some historical background, um, breast cancer is unique in that it started essentially with kind of more radical surgery and then we've slowly been peeling back over the last um, decades. Um, but Halstead had a theory in the early 19th century, which is essentially this theory of breast cancer being a, started as a local regional process um, that spread kind of uh, um, contiguously through the lymphatics um, into the axilla and then metastasized distantly. He really discounted the um, the importance of uh, hematogenous spread or more um, distant metastasis, you know, prior to um, kind of this contiguous spread through the lymphatics. Paget around this same time had kind of a differing theory of cancer, which was more the seed and soil theory, which was essentially that the cancer cells spread everywhere, but had to kind of land in an area that was amenable to their growth before that cancer could, um, you know, kind of, kind of uh, continue to grow or uh, become a true metastasis. Um, so Halstead really popularized the uh, radical mastectomy, which you can see in the picture here. Um, which was removal of the breast, the pec major, the pec minor, uh, 
the um, level one, two, and three axillary lymph nodes and left women with a large wound that in most uh, circumstances had to have a skin graft um, for, for coverage of that wound. So it was a pretty morbid operation, but this was a time before you know, systemic therapy, uh, before radiation therapy. And uh, he, in his small case series that he published at this time, he actually showed you know, some um, benefit uh, of improved mortality uh, with this approach. Um, and th this was largely the approach for breast cancer up until the 1970s. So, you know, for almost 70 years um, before, you know, people started slowly peeling back and the modified radical mastectomy or preservation of the pec major, you know, level one and level two axillary lymph node dissection um, became more standard over the uh, radical mastectomy. Through this time, um, axillary lymph node involvement uh, remained kind of the main determinant of five-year survival. And therefore, it was kind of believed that, you know, if this was the main determinant that, you know, taking out these lymph nodes improved local regional control and there, therefore kind of the surrogate being survival. Um, so, you know, through this, through this time, the 70s um, to the 90s, the modified radical mastectomy um, was largely the standard of care for most patients with breast cancer, clinically node negative or, or node positive. Um, in the early 90s, um, Morton and colleagues kind of uh, did the first sentinel lymph node biopsy for breast cancer. Um, it had been used for melanoma previously. Um, and their theory was you know, essentially the lymphatic drainage from the breast, you know, as you can see in these pictures, you know, you could you you could inject this uh, peritumorally or subdermally, um, and really in any quadrant, um, and it should go to to the axilla. Um, and so, in their study, in their kind of evaluation of the uh, efficacy of sentinel lymph node biopsy, they only used isosulfan blue, um, and they were able to identify the sentinel lymph node in uh, around two thirds of the patients, which is not great. Um, but did show that when they were able to identify the sentinel node, that it was 96% accurate of predicting the, uh, the rest of the uh, axillary nodal basin. Um, uh, a couple of years later, Veronese and colleagues kind of uh, improved the procedure um, and, and really modernized it, which is the way we, we do the procedure today, which is um, they use uh, radio technetium 99 labeled albumin um, and had a much higher success rate um, than previously. So just to kind of summarize this historic timeline, the radical mastectomy was a standard of care up until the 1970s. From the 70s to the 90s, um, the standard of care was really modified radical mastectomy uh, for these patients. After the 90s um, is when sentinel lymph node biopsy became more and more popular for clinically node negative patients. Um, and then as, uh, and, and through this time, things were relatively simple. Um, if someone did not, if someone had an unsuccessful uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, they got an axillary lymph node dissection. If someone had a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, they got an axillary lymph node dissection. Um, and if the sentinel lymph node biopsy was negative, then um, their axilla was complete at that time. Around the early, um, 2000 and teens is when Z11 and several other trials were published, and that's going to be the bulk of our talk today, um, which is really complicated uh, management of the axilla, um, and uh, we'll get into that. So it, as we all know, th this is just kind of a sum or, you know, a summary slide, but um, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in breast cancer. Um, there's you know, essentially four main uh, you know, clinical types of breast cancer, and these are all managed a little bit differently um, as far as you know, what kind of adjuvant uh, therapy or neoadjuvant therapy these patients get. Um, the staging of breast cancer has changed dramatically since you know, when I was a, um, an intern. Um, the historical way that we stage breast cancer was an anatomic staging system a TNM with that end stage being the most um, important prognostic factor for um, overall survival. Um, now um, it has become a lot more complicated, especially with the, you know, the importance of the, the biomarkers, the grade, the hormone status, and the uh, H, 
or a hair to uh, status. And then um, also unique to the, the new staging system is um, the inclusion of the Oncotype DX um, or the recurrence score. So this, this next slide is not so, you, you know, we memorize all this, but it's just to show that people with the same TNM stage can have either a 1B at the top right-hand corner or can be 3B um, based on what their uh, biomarkers are, um, which has really shifted the um, staging to be much more important on the biomarkers than necessarily the, you know, the, ant or the anatomy. Um, of the tumor itself. So just start the talk, we're gonna talk about what the NCCN recommends for uh, management of the axilla, and then we're gonna talk about all the trials um, that have uh, um, kind of influenced how we've gotten to this point. Um, as you know, on the sides, there's a lot of um, superscripts by uh, almost all the recommendations, and that's because a lot of this is nuanced and, and not as cut and dry is this uh, this algorithm kind of makes it out to be, but it's a good starting point. So this top left-hand corner up here is going to be your clinically node-negative patients or those with one or two kind of suspicious nodes on imaging, especially with the um, kind of the standardization of uh, preoperative axillary uh, ultrasound. I um, mean, you know, we're seeing a lot more of these suspicious nodes than we, than we had in the past. So these patients should all get sentinel node uh, mapping with their, with their primary surgery. And if the sentinel node's negative, then you're done. Uh, no further ax axillary management is necessary. If, they, if the patient only has uh, micrometastases, then you are also done. And so micrometastases being, um, you know, uh, metastases less than uh, 0.2 millimeters. Um, and if they have macro metastases, then that, that's where they kind of fall into the, the Z11 trials we've all you know, probably heard of in, 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 uh, previously and that we're going to talk about later, um, in which if they had a T1, uh, TT tumor, they only had one to two positive uh, sentinel nodes. Um, you know, they were getting breast uh, conservation uh, therapy with whole breast radiation therapy planned, um, and they did not receive new adjuvant chemotherapy, then, then you were also done with this patient, and th they do not require an axillary lymph node dissection. If uh, the sentinel lymph node is not identified, the NCCN still recommends completion axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, I'll say, that, you know, that is controversial, um, and would, would really depend on the, the scenario. Um, so moving on to the clinically node positive patients, uh, these patients are much more likely to get you know, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy um, in, in the, the current day and, day and age. Um, so these patients, three or more positive nodes or, or uh, matted nodes on physical exam or um, greater than um, N1 uh, by ultrasound. Uh, and so you really start with um, FNA or core needle biopsy, if these abnormal appearing nodes are negative, then you go right back up to the above algorithm of the clinically node negative patients. If the uh, FNA or core biopsy is positive, um, then it really depends on uh, whether or not they get neoadjuvant um, chemotherapy. Um, if no neoadjuvant chemotherapy is given, um, then you can either, um, depending on their node status, so if they're, they're matted nodes and they you know, get an axillary lymph node dissection if, you know, they have three abnormal, you know, three suspicious uh, nodes, then you may consider more of, you know, like a targeted uh, lymph node dissection, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, if preoperative pre chemotherapy is given, um, then this is where um, it really depends on what happens to their axilla after the preoperative chemotherapy. If they become clinically node negative, then it is appropriate to proceed with the targeted axillary dissection. If they remain uh, node positive, um, then this is a situation in which, you know, they may require an axillary lymph node dissection. So we're going to get into this a little bit more, um, and hopefully um, you have some questions in your head um, after looking at this algorithm, and hopefully we can answer some of them. Um, so this just is all the um, the kind of superscripts from that chart. We're not going to go through all of them, but it's just good to look at this when you have time. Um, you know, the NCCN, you know, um, just kind of reiterate some of the things we talked about earlier. 
um, as far as sentinel lymph node biopsy being the uh, primary um, axillary staging system for staging surgery. Um, and that, you know, in elderly patients or some select populations, you consider uh, less aggressive surgery. Um, so lots of trials to how we got here today. Um, we're going to try to go through all of these. Um, the, the ones at the bottom here are still accruing, but are going to be quite helpful um, in the future um, for how we manage the axilla. So we're going to start with NSA uh, BPB4. Um, mostly, um, this had most influence in kind of being the um, putting an end to the uh, Halstead radical mastectomy. But I, but I think it's useful um, with the 25-year data and what it showed with um, uh, management of the axle for these patients. So there's essentially five groups. There are uh, three in the clinically node negative group and two in the clinically node positive group. In the node negative group, they either underwent a Halstead mastectomy, a uh, total mastectomy with uh, regional uh, nodal radiation or a total mastectomy alone, um, and then in the node positive group, they either underwent a Halstead radical mastectomy or a total mastectomy with regional node radiation. This is a time where uh, there's really no uh, adjuvant systemic therapy, uh, chemotherapy for these patients. Um, and the radiation con uh, therapy consisted of uh, 50 gray, which is uh, pretty similar to um, uh, current radiation therapy. So what did they find? Um, the 25-year data for these patients. Um, so these are um, th they essentially found no difference um, between the groups in terms of distant disease-free survival, overall survival for these patients. Um, and one thing to note is that if patients started out with a total mastectomy group and later became clinically node positive, then they went on to uh, receive an axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, but they remained in the uh, total mastectomy group as far as um, uh, their uh, uh, survival and um, recurrence-free survival. Um, so the one thing I wanted to point out here um, is just that um, between the um, the mastectomy group who did not undergo radiation therapy, um, and then the, the radical mastectomy and the mastectomy group that did undergo radiation therapy, there was a difference in local or, uh, or regional recurrence in the, the women who were initially clinically node negative. Okay, so kind of the conclusions from, from this study, 40% um, of the patients you know, who underwent radical mastectomy had positive axillary lymph nodes. Um, which is slightly higher um, than current numbers, but pretty consistent. Um, and then 19% of the patients who had initially negative um, lymph node or clinically negative uh, axilla uh, went on to undergo um, axilla and lymph node dissection um, at a median of about 15 months. Um, the For the um, clinically node positive group, the um, there's about a four percent axillary recurrence between the two groups, and I think this is one one of the more influential kind of things to take away from this paper, is that the the group with total mastectomy with nodal radiation had a had the same axillary recurrence as the group who underwent a Halstead radical mastectomy, and that would be important kind of for uh, influencing future trials. There's another really um, important thing here, Alex. If you take a second, so how do you interpret the data that 40% of patients undergoing radical mastectomy have positive nodes, as, and then 19% of people going total mastectomy, randomized total mastectomy, develop nodal recurrence. If they were randomized correctly, we thought we were leaving disease behind in 40% of those patients, but only 19% of those patients went on to getting an ax dissection. Yeah, so that tells me a couple of things. One, um, you know, breast cancer presented usually at a more advanced stage, um, and there's and this kind of shows that you know without uh, adjuvant therapy um, for some of for some of these patients that you know recurrences are higher. But also it shows that 20% of the patients, uh, you you could as you know assume if this was randomized correctly that 20% of these patients would occult 
you know, clinically occult um, axillary metastases did not become clinically significant. Um, and so this just kind of is, is just one of the many trials showing the overtreatment of the axilla and the kind of the over, um, o the, I, I suppose the over importance place on um, um, that is, you know, being necessary to achieve uh, local regional control. Well, first, it begged the question, right? I mean, we we're assuming we left disease behind in 40 of those patients, but 40 but 40 percent did not become clinically apparent. Mm -hmm. And it yes, was sir. the first trial to really show that leaving disease behind in the axilla doesn't necessarily mean you're dooming the patient. Yes, sir. I got a I got kind of overlooked earlier on, but you can understand like the, the the default treatment for breast cancer as well as for many cancers is to get everything out regardless of where it is. And this factors into why it's become so complicated recently. But this yes, is sir. like a great first example of we can leave disease behind. And we, we knew, we've known since the 70s, we leave disease behind. It's not always going to become clinically apparent. And then remember, these oh, are people well, that aren't. If, you, if it does become clinically apparent, if you operate on it then, it doesn't impact survival. Um, and it's the same, you know, this fits perfectly with MSLT2. But, you know, during the 70s, Radical modified radical mastectomy still was the standard of care, and you kind of touch on that at the bottom, um, mm -hmm. because even though doing a completion axillary dissection when they develop clinically positive nodes um, provides okay disease control and doesn't seem to impact overall survival, it is harder to do, and so at the time there was a little less focus on um, patient outcomes, quality of life stuff, and so the thought was well, 20% of patients are going to recur. Yeah. Right there. It's okay, it doesn't matter. The other, another point. Yes, please. Another point, and uh, it, it's a point you're making, but I just want to be more explicit about it. The uh, the operation as it evolved is mastectomy and axillary, and mastectomy with axillary dissection was one operation. And as that was shown to be effective, there was a great reluctance to separate it into two different procedures. But we've separated it now because of the morbidity of axillary dissection and because of the questions about its effectiveness or necessity. But it, if, if axillary dissection were in, introduced now as a separate procedure, I think there wouldn't be enough evidence to recommend it. But because it comes with breast cancer treatment as a package, now we have to show that it's not necessary with data to exclude it. And that's part of this conundrum. Yeah. What's nice about what's nice and what's not nice about breast cancer is they have the data to do this, but you see this across all you see this across other cancer types as well, as well as other fields like trauma. Like, you know, who do we not need to do a trauma spleen on? This is the story for that in cancer. But yeah. It's good for thought. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Alex. <laughs> no worries, sir. It's all, all helpful. Um, so, the NSABP before basically at the end of this, um, you know, modified radical mastectomy, as we've talked about, was was, was essentially the standard of care um, uh, for these below reasons. So, moving on, um, let's we'll, we'll talk about the uh, B32 trial, um, which really. Um, um, was sentinel lymph node biopsy versus axillary lymph, lymph node dissection for the uh, clinically node negative women. And, and this essentially established sentinel lymph node biopsy in this patient population is, is the standard of care. So there were two groups, um, uh, essentially the sentinel node biopsy plus axillary lymph node dissection group, and then the sentinel lymph node biopsy with axillary lymph node dissection only if positive nodes were found on the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, the sentinel node biopsies were performed with dual tracer in this evaluation, and sentinel nodes were defined as any nodes that were radioactive, blue, or um, hard or suspicious on um, exam. Um, and H&E was utilized to evaluate these nodes uh, for metastases. Uh, primary endpoints were overall survival with kind of secondary outcomes of regional control and morbidity. Um, and adjuvant systemic therapy, radiation therapy was well balanced between the two groups. Um, and so what this found was that there was essentially no, uh, no statistical difference in overall or disease-free survival between these two groups. 
Um, and uh, furthermore, um, the single lymph node biopsy had a 97% success rate. Um, the single node was positive in about a quarter of the women in both groups. The false negative rate in group one was about 9.8%. So this is a group that also underwent completion axillary lymph node dissection. Um, and then these results were confirmed by a uh, further randomized controlled trial out of Europe. Um, which uh, also uh, demonstrated no significant difference in overall uh, survival with sentinel node biopsy um, in, in uh, clinically node negative patients. So th this essentially uh, made that standard of care. Um, but at this time, completion axillary lymph node dissection was still recommended if the sentinel node was positive. So um, just a uh, few trials that uh, also supported um, the efficacy of a uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, and this really, all this together kind of set the stage for uh, Z11, which is essentially kind of our, our continue um, to, to um, question the benefit of uh, axillary lymph node dissection. Um, so Z11, um, you know, we're all most of us are familiar with this trial, but um, it enrolled patients with uh, T1 through T2 tumors. Uh, they had to be clinically no negative, so no palpable adenopathy. Um, and all patients had to have at least one to two sentinel lymph nodes with metastatic uh, breast cancer um, to be eligible for this trial. Uh, notable were that um, if metastases were identified by IHC only, or you know they were occult metastases, um, then they were ineligible for Z11. If they had three or more positive nodes or um, a clinically positive axilla, they were um, in, ineligible. Um, and then if they had extra nodal extension or if they underwent neoadjuvant therapy, uh, they were ineligible for this trial. So the, the two groups were, um, or between the two groups, um, People were then randomized to either axillary lymph node dissection, which was a level one um, and two dissection, um, and patients had to have at least um, 10 uh, lymph nodes removed versus no further axillary specific intervention, um, which included nodal ir irradiation, but I put a little asterisk here and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, so this, the initial plan um, was to enroll 1900 women um, and to close after 500 deaths, but due to um, a much lower anticipated event rate, being that uh, survival was very high uh, in, in this trial, it was uh, closed early um, by the um, safety and monitoring um, uh, committee. So the primary and secondary endpoints of Z11 um, were overall survival um, and disease-free survival, um, and there's no uh, significant uh, differences between the two groups. Uh, morbidity was kind of reported as an aggregate and you can see was much higher in the axillary lymph node dissection group as compared to the uh, sentinel lymph node uh, biopsy group. Um, so what to take away from this trial? Um, patients, you know, almost um, a third to a half of the patients um, had micrometastases um, when for the axillary lymph node dissection group, an additional 27% of lymph nodes were positive with completion axillary lymph node dissection. Um, there were really no differences in adjuvant systemic therapy. Um, and local recurrence was uh, low and consistent with the, the NSABP uh, B4 trial um, with recurrences of the axilla of 2% in the sentinel lymph node arm and 4% in axillary lymph node dissection arm with axillary specific recurrence, you know, being less than 1% in both groups. Uh, the caveat here is that um, these patients um, all underwent lumpectomy uh, and whole breast irradiation as we discussed. Um, that whole breast radiation does include the, uh, some of the lower axilla um, and therefore you know, it's kind of unknown what clinical significance that that, that has. Um, but this really set the stage to, um, th that routine completion axial lymph node dissection um, is not justified and does not, you know, affect overall or disease-free survival. Um, and there, you know, there may be either other ways to sterilize the axilla or some of those, um, you know, additional, you know, 
27% positive nodes may not become um, clinically significant. So just a summarization um, of the, um, the um, or eligibility criteria on the, on the right here. So what if a patient got a mastectomy? Um, there has been a trial that included mastectomy patients since. Um, this was a, a similar trial to above, although um, they did, um, they, they um, only uh, enrolled patients with micrometastases, so uh, metastases that were less than uh, two millimeter but greater than 0.2 millimeters in size. Um, and uh, they're uh, similar axillary lymph node dissection versus no axillary lymph node dissection. About 9% of the patients received mastectomy. But, it, but I, what I think is important from this is that um, another 22% of patients did not undergo axillary um, radiation, either not getting radiation therapy at all or only getting kind of partial um, uh, breast irradiation. Um, so the, the the findings were were the you know similar. There's no um, differences in disease-free um, uh, survival, um, and the rest of the uh, adjuvant uh, therapy was balanced between the groups. The, they had a lower um, additional positive lymph node um, in the axillary lymph node dissection group. They only had 13%. And overall, axillary recurrence was also uh, less than 1% for both groups. Um, so this just shows that all, all these points cross midline, um, and none of them were uh, clinically significant on subgroup analysis. Um, I put this trial in here now uh, just because I think it, 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 you know, it fits closest with the above data. Um, this is the Amaros trial, um, which you know, Z11 was published kind of right around the same time and I think made, you know, some of this trial obsolete, but there's still something to take away from it. Um, so this was essentially axillary XRT versus axillary lymph node dissection plus or minus XRT. And so it was really kind of up to um, the final pathology, uh, or, you know, final uh, multidisciplinary discussion whether or not these patients also got uh, nodal, nodal uh, basin radiation. Um, so similarly, T1 through T2 tumors, the patient had to be clinically node negative, um, but there was no um, specification on how many nodes um, could be positive to be enrolled in this trial. Um, so 33% of the axillary lymph node group had additional positive nodes. The primary endpoints being were uh, axillary recurrence in this trial, and it immediate. Uh, it's supposed to be median follow-up of uh, 6.1 years. The axillary lymph node, or the um, axillary recurrence was was lower than expected. It was expected to be about 2% in the axillary lymph node dissection group and around 4% in the uh, radiation group. And um, you can see here that it was, you know, lower than expected. Um, the the big takeaway from this is that the clinical lymphedema rate was double for the axillary lymph node dissection group. Um, and being 23% and 11% if uh, by clinical report and by uh, objective measures being arm, arm circumference difference greater than 10%, um, it was one, about one half of that for each of the two groups. Um, There's no statistically significant quality of life differences detected. I, I think the important takeaway though from this is that, you know, 95% of patients after Z11 wouldn't have been eligible for an axillary lymph node dissection based on um, these data. Um, and um, it, early enrollment included isolated tumor cells, um, and these were also found to not be as clinically significant. Um, and so there, I just have, there's a lot of asterisks um, for this trial, but for the patients with three or more nodes, there was no differences. Um, you know, between between those groups um, as well. So that kind of begs so, the question. Real quick, Alex, uh, just go back one slide. Yes, sir. So first of all, 1% of the patients had four or more nodes. So I, I would say that you should entirely ignore that. And even 4% having three nodes is a little sketchy. The other thing about the demographics of these two trials, so who was enrolled in these two trials in general? Uh, there, it was like 50% um, triple negative and HER2 uh, positive, I believe. 
Uh, actually, hold on. I'm getting my trials mixed up. Both of them are very similar. So what percent did you say were triple negative? Uh, I thought it was like 20 um 20 percent were triple negative and like 30 percent were hair two positive um, i don't remember and i don't remember exactly but it's a low percent were triple negative and the other thing is that most of them were postmenopausal. so and yes. i mean you got to think about you know when especially when z11 happened a lot of people didn't think that it was the right thing to do they had trouble enrolling because people were sort of encamped in one of the two sides of this argument and so the people who got enrolled were the lowest risk people, right? So they enrolled people okay. who were ER, PR positive, the majority, not a vast majority, I think like 65% were ER positive uh, and around 60% were, um, were uh, postmenopausal as well. So, you know, I just have a little bit of trouble knowing what to do with like a 30 per, or a 35 year old woman with triple negative breast cancer who has a couple positive nodes. Yes, we have sir. to give a little bit of caution there. I mean, again, I think, uh, I've been pretty swayed by Dr. Martin that that axillary dissection maybe helps no one, but we do have to understand the demographics of these trials that most of the women enrolled here were on the lower risk end of the spectrum. Yes, sir. A big caveat though is the high volume institutions applied that and at least their retrospective data support that as well. Like the memorial data after Z11, memorial is one of those places that really champions Z11 and really pushes people that way. And when we looked at our outcomes for women that got steered down the Z11 route, the triple negatives and the HER2 positives and the young patients all did the same. Take that for what it's worth, but um, kind of depends on the institution you're at and um, your institution's willingness to, to play along with you as a surgeon. And this will come up when we're talking about what we do with our rad onks here. Yes, sir. So um, I just wanted to define, you know, what is, you know, clinically. Um, significant positive lymph node in patients who have not received new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, just briefly here. Um, so just uh, uh, um, kind of an after um, evaluation um, of occult lymph node metastases in the B32 trial showed that there were 16% occult metastases um, by IHC evaluation um, with the breakdown you see here. Um, and the overall survival was statistically significant, but being, you know, it, um, um, as low as it was, you know, 0.8%, it was probably of marginal clinical significance. And so um, the conclusion from this um, in Z10 were essentially that for patients who have not undergone new adjuvant chemotherapy, um, H&E eva evaluation is uh, sufficient. Um, for uh, and IHC really yields no clinical benefit. So, so why, do we, why do we still do IHC? I always wonder this. Um, so I, IHC, uh, I'll talk about a little bit later, is is uh, important for um, patients who've had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Well, and what about then, just the routine patient who hasn't had neoadjuvant? They still often will do IHC. Why do they do that? It's more um, to confirm. So they have suspicion on H&E, and, &E and um, a lot of these trials or uh, recommendations allow the pathologist to then follow up. The, yeah, it's kind of the opposite. So it's easier to see a MET on IHC. So it like makes it stand out on the stain, right? It turns it brown. Yes, uh, and so they'll often do IHC so that they can quickly look through the node, and then they'll confirm with H&E. But then you get these situations where you have an IHC positive node, but it's clinically meaningless, and then you have to explain that to the patient. So when you guys leave here, you get an IHC positive node, just understand if they didn't get new adjuvant, you don't have to do anything about it. But the patients will be like, well, what do we do with this? Because it's on their path report and they see it. So you have to be prepared for that conversation. It, it was different back then. Though they were doing not just IHC, but they were also doing serial sectioning of the nodes. So they'd have like you know 10 slices. Now they just bivalve the node. They still use IHC, but basically because it makes their pathologist's job easier. Um, but not everybody does it because if you're at a civilian place, you have to. It costs money to do IHC. You know, the, the stains cost money, and so they have to justify that. Here they do it because it, you know, doesn't cost. Nobody gets billed or whatever. It's just easier to do. So um, moving on. The Z10 um, trial was essentially just kind of an offshoot of uh, Z11, um, and so very similar patient demographics. The, the big difference here is that um, these patients underwent 
sentinel node biopsy and then bilateral iliac crack iliac crest bone marrow aspiration um, and they just wanted to evaluate the importance of um, my, uh, bone marrow micrometastases um, and these um, uh, sentinel lymph node micro or occult metastases so um, uh, 11% of the um, patients had occult lymph node metastases, which is kind of similar to the uh, the um, retrospective evaluation of the B32 um, data, and 3% of patients had occult bone marrow metastases. For, for the occult lymph node metastases, there was no overall survival difference. Um, for the bone marrow metastases, there was an overall survival benefit, but the, the incidence was so low that you really just can't recommend that all patients get, you know, a cold or uh, get uh, iliac crest, crest bone marrow um, aspirations as part of, you know, their routine surgery. So basically this just kind of confirmed, you know, what we just talked about. Um, so just to summarize briefly for the clinically no negative patient, um, you know, Z11's had, had a, a lot of, you know, influence on, you know, who gets completion axial lymph node dissection. And so this is just kind of tiered the data of, you know, what's kind of strong, strong data. Um, and, you know, where, you know, when is it, you know, generally not recommended, you know, that patients um, not get an axial lymph node dissection. Um, um, and, but we, what we haven't talked about yet is, uh, you know, what do we do if patients get neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So that's kind of the next part of the talk. You know we're um, over time here, um, but so just to start out, um, we'll start out with the Sentina trial. I, I don't, um, I, I don't like this trial as much, um, and I, I don't think there's as much to take away from it. Um, but what they what they did um, was they performed Sentinel lymph node biopsy before neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this A group. And if those patients were positive, then they, you know, became eligible for the B group. Um, and what they showed was, is, is, you know, as we all know, there's kind of a high success rate for sentinel lymph node biopsy if performed before neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and, and what this B group showed, um, you know, who all got sentinel node biopsy and axillary lymph node dissection. So this is a second sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and, and I think they showed what would be expected is that, you know, the sentinel lymph node identification rate was much lower um, and the false negative rate was much higher. And so, you know, that this raised a lot of concern of the e efficacy of sentinel lymph node biopsy after new adjuvant chemotherapy. But I think one of the caveats here is that these patients have also already undergone a sentinel node biopsy procedure. So the second group um, within this trial were all clinically node positive. Um, and if they converted, if they remain node positive after new adjuvant chemotherapy, then they all got axillary lymph node dissection. If they converted to node negative, then they got a sentinel node biopsy plus an axillary lymph node dissection. Um, and so what this showed was that the um, identification rate is lower than would be expected, you know, for a, a sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure. Um, for the identification rate, but also that it, it really had a prohibitively high false negative rate. But um, in subgroup analysis, that false negative rate was reduced if patients either had three or more nodes removed or if dual tracer was used. And so this kind of set the stage for some, some further trials. Um, one of those being um, the Z1071 trial. So um, as you can see here, the demographic um, you know, of their, uh, of their breast cancer, um, the patients had to have at least two sentinel lymph nodes, um, removed. Their primary endpoint was a false negative rate, and they all got sentinel lymph node, uh, biopsy and axillary lymph node dissection after, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So in, in this, um, trial, they had a, they had a pretty high success rate, you know, over 93%, um, technical success. Um, and of the um, of the the patients um, who uh, met all the eligibility criteria, there was a 41% pathologic complete response rate on completion axial lymph node dissection. And so, you know, this raises a question: you know, did 41% of women in this trial get an axial lymph node dissection with 
you know, are arguably no, you know, clinical benefit. Um, so what did they find? They also found that their false negative rate was higher than the pre-specified 10% rate. But if the, um, if the clip node was re retrieved as a sentinel lymph node, that false negative rate was much lower, 6.8%. Um, and the clip node was not a um, sentinel node. Um, and, you know, uh, 37 you know, percent of these patients and was either, you know, found in the axillary contents or was not found at all. Um, they also kind of supported that, you know, false negative rate is lower with more than uh, three sentinel lymph nodes um, and with uh, dual agent uh, therapy. Um, and that when IHC identified isolated tumor cells were included, that that false negative rate was also um, improved in this trial from 126 to 8.7%. So, uh, lastly, uh, we're just going to talk about the, oh, I'm sorry, we have two more. So, we'll talk just about the, uh, this one, Alex. Yeah, do what? Just um, very briefly mention this. Yeah, so just, the EPNAC trial um, basically um, just kind of confirmed a lot of the above. Um, IHC was mandatory for this trial. Um, any uh, MET was positive. Um, so, sorry, I, I know we're running out of time. So, the targeted axillary dissection, uh, those above trials kind of set the stage for this, which is really um, where they just confirmed, you know, actually going after a localized clip node um, kind of improves the false negative rate. And so um, all patients had to have an axillary lymph node dissection to be included in this group. They also had a 37% uh, pathologic complete response rate. Um, and they found that with just identification of all of these nodes, the false negative rate was 4.2%, you know, with the clip node alone. If patients got a sentinel lymph node biopsy, the false negative rate was high, but if they added the clip, clip node to that, it, you know, it became much lower. Um, and then in patients who underwent, you know, a true targeted axillary dissection surgery plus, you know, axillary lymph node dissection, the false negative rate was 2%. So this kind of, you know, set the stage um, um, to you know, kind of how we currently manage the axle after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which um, essentially is that you know, single node prior to neoadjuvant chemotherapy really um, is thought to just increase the rate of axle or lymph node, um, you know, dissection, um, and and you know, up to forty percent of patients become clinically node negative, you know, after after the fact, um, and then. Just as we talked about, the false negative rates improved with more than three nodes, dual tracer, IHC evaluation, and then including the clip node um, in the um, targeted axillary dissection. So we talked about a lot today. Um, this just kind of summarizes um, a lot of what we talked about of you know when to perform axillary surgery and you know some in um, each of the um, of the groups. Uh, so I won't uh, belabor this again. I think we've we've hit on all of this. Um, this is patients who've undergone neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I'll, I'll upload these slides to my L drive if people want to review them later. Um, and then just special considerations. You know, pregnant patients um, shouldn't get uh, die. They should only be only have their sentinel node biopsy with you know radioisotope. There is a push that you know elderly patients may not need axillary surgery at all, um, especially if it's not going to affect you know adjuvant therapy. Um, and then inflammatory breast cancer patients should still you know undergo undergo modified radical mastectomy, which includes that axillary lymph node dissection. Um, future studies um, uh, that are, that will just help um, you know guide further axillary management. Um, you know this. Um, Alliance trial here, I think, you know, may, you know, may kind of prove what a lot of us suspect, which is that radiation therapy is just as good as axillary lymph node dissection, but more, more to follow. Um, and, and that's, that's all I have today. Sorry, I know, I know that went long. Thanks, Alex. So one of the issues that's kind of ongoing is, um, right now, you know, we have Amaros and Z11 that say we don't have to do an axillary dissection if you have low volume positive sentinel lymph nodes um, and they were both based on clinical exam um, 
but we're routinely doing axial ultrasound, which is going to find nodes that would be, uh, you know, imperceptible on, or not imperceptible, and not palpable on physical exam. And so you end up with patients getting classified as clinically node positive and no longer being fitting into the um, C11 or amorous pathways. And so we feel like we're doing too many axial dissections. So we actually have a, a working group meeting today to hash that out because uh, there's a couple options, but one is to stop doing routine X or ultrasounds. Um, you know, it seems silly to not get free information, but at the same time, you know, we know from screening tests that information you get is not always free. If you do routine MRIs, if you do routine neck ultrasounds for screening, like it leads to a uh, to problems. Um, so uh, anyway, we're trying to kind of come to a group, a, a, a pathway that all services can live with. But um, a lot's going to change, continue to change, and I think it'll generally lead to less uh, axillary surgery, frankly. Um, but we'll we'll see. Do you have any questions about all that stuff? Uh, Alex, that was a tour de force. Thank you for summarizing all of that. Yes, sir. Thank you for your help. That was a really nice talk. I just, I'm just sort of throwing that out there. It was a really comprehensive review, especially for an hour. All right. Thanks, everybody.